So tonight we have planned to continue on with the theme that we were taking up during uh, the couple of weeks of consistent gospel meetings that we had. And we were looking at uh, different words uh, that together told us something of the glory of the gospel message, but were uh, on their own uh, opposite words. And tonight the words that we want to look at are sickness and whole, being sick or being whole or sick and healthy. Um, words that are very prevalent today, especially amidst the pandemic. How many individuals can't go back to work, can't leave their house, can't do things because either they have a sickness or they have been restored to health or to be whole. So we're going to read a verse tonight, very famous verse. It's found in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 5 and verse 31. Luke 5 and verse 31. I'm going to read one verse, but going to reference some other verses and some other thoughts that are connected with this gospel of Luke. Luke 5 and verse 31, these are the words of the Lord Jesus. And Jesus answering said unto them, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. They that are whole don't need a physician, but sick people do. That's what he's saying here. Sick people need a doctor. We all know that. We agree with this statement. Sick people need doctors. Healthy people don't. But then what he says next is really what is in a major disagreement amongst a lot of people. As he says this, I came not to call good people, righteous people, but sinners to repentance. What he's saying is here is, he says, if, if you don't have problems, you don't need Christ. If you don't have sins, you don't need Christ. Christ came for people who had the sickness of sin, which the Bible tells us everyone has, but not everyone wants to admit to it because of their pride. So that's our verse for tonight, and that's what I hope to speak on in the gospel meeting tonight. A uh, very unique book, the book of Luke, tells us all that we could want to know about medicine and doctors, because Luke himself is one of the few, if only mentioned, doctors in the whole Bible. Not a lot of doctors make their way onto the pages of scripture in our Bible. Um, actually, it's very unique in the Bible. There's still a lot of things said about doctors that are still true today. Um, there's there's podiatrists in the Bible. There's a king named Asa, and, and in 2 Chronicle, he, he, doesn't consort, he doesn't consult God, but he looks for a doctor for a problem he had with his foot. And so we often talk about podiatrists and whether or not they're real doctors. Well, they were real doctors in the Bible. And uh, the oldest book of the Bible, Job, Job says, he goes, you coat the truth with lies. You're nothing better than bad doctors. And we say, oh, that's, that's just how it is today, too. Doctors, they, they don't tell us the truth. They kind of sugarcoat it sometimes. And uh, Job said that thousands and thousands of years ago and still true today. And in the Gospels, the Lord Jesus talk, tells us about a woman who spent everything she had on doctors. And how many of us have been so pleased with medical uh, advancements until we get that bill in the mail? And you realize, how in the world did that surgery cost me $72,000? You say, spent all that we had on doctors. And so what was true thousands of years ago, still true today when it comes to, comes to what the Bible tells us about doctors and what we know today. But what is significant is that almost 25% of the New Testament was written by a doctor, this man Luke. He wrote the Gospel of Luke, and he wrote the Book of Acts. And, and he saw all these diseases, and he talked about them as he wrote about the Lord Jesus confronting people who had problems with uh, their eyes, problems with their ears, problems with their mouths, problems with their hands, people who were paralyzed, people who uh, had issues. Uh, he would say uh, they needed an endocrinologist. They had blood issues. And, and so Luke saw all these issues. Luke dealt with uh, pregnancy problems that he talked about in the Bible. And he, he, so he had all this medical background, but as a major contributor to the New Testament, you know what he gave the most precedent to was the problem of sin. As a physician, he addressed so succinctly, he said, this is the major problem. We used to have these old hymn books and on the front of the hymn book, it used to say, life is a vapor. That's from the book of James. And then it said this, death is sure. That's, that's from the book of Romans. And it said this, sin is the cause. Christ is the cure. Life is the vapor. Death is sure. Sin is the cause of death. 
Christ is the cure of sin. Tremendous statement. And Luke, over and over again, this physician, he tells us, this physician says, all the ailments of the body, they can rob you of enjoyment, but true, true theft of the joy of life is not found in getting rid of ailments. It's in not addressing the sin of the soul. Addressing the sin of this soul is what will lead me to the joy of life and to the joy of everlasting life. And so this physician tells me that. Not only that, it's Luke who records some of the famous first words of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus one day in Nazareth, he stood up. He stood up in a synagogue and he, he gave his mission statement. And his mission statement involved healing the blind, preaching the gospel to the poor, those who were bruised and broken. And, and his mission statement went out to those who had difficulties in this body. But his mission statement was to do something in the power of God that would last beyond this life. And it's very unique. Luke only records these words of the Lord Jesus. Luke says this, the Lord Jesus looked on everybody that he was speaking to. And he said this, you will say to me, physician, heal yourself. It's the only time we have that proverb recorded. So Luke, the physician, tells us this very famous proverb about the Lord Jesus. We still kind of use that today. We don't like taking advice from people who have the same problems we have. You're probably don't want your dentist to have a lot of cavities. You don't want your, you know, you, you don't want your trainer at the gym to be grossly overweight. You don't want to, to, to go to someone who has the same ailment who's going to take care of you. Physician, heal yourself. You almost want to tell people, deal with your problems before you deal with mine. And the Lord Jesus said, You will say that to me. But was what was so unique about Jesus Christ is that he didn't have this problem of sin. He never had this issue. He didn't have it in his mind. He didn't have it in his actions. He didn't have it in his words. He was sinless. And so when he said that, people did not recognize that here was a doctor who did not have their ailment, did not have their problem. How fantastic to know that there was a man who walked this globe who did not have the problem that has been greater than any pandemic known to man. And has been around since day, since the beginning of time. This problem of sin that brings everyone under its control. And here Christ says, you're looking at a man who does not have the problem. And therefore, I am the man who can deliver you from that. And then we read the words here of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, they that are whole do not need a doctor. Thank goodness. Thank goodness the Lord Jesus could state truth like that. We look at people and how much we appreciate our health today, how much we appreciate health and well-being. And we say, so good to have your health. In fact, uh, we have people who come over and they say, we, we long that you have the health to enjoy your marriage, the health to enjoy your family, the health to enjoy it. How precious it is and how fleeting it is. But how wonderful to know when you're whole, the last thing on your mind is a doctor. But then the Lord Jesus says, no, you know who needs doctors are people who are sick. But how many of us know people and they won't seek medical attention? They just won't go in. They won't, they won't, they're they're skeptical. They 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 think it's a scam. They they won't address doctors or physicians or specialists because they don't want the help. And they always say, well, the first thing is admitting you have a problem in order to seeking counsel. And the Lord Jesus says, only sick people need doctors. And every one of us tonight would say, Amen. That's true. But then the Lord Jesus, he adds another statement directly connected to this. And he says, I didn't come for good people. I came for bad people. I came for sinners. It's hard to hear those words and still think that I'm going to achieve heaven based upon my own goodness and my own good works. Because that's not who Christ came for. That's not who he came into the world to save. He came to save sinners. He came to save the ungodly. He died for the ungodly. So how significant when we look at it here, that here's a physician. Here's one, and he states the case as it could be. His diagnosis is spot on. There is no need for a second opinion. He is the one who made the human frame. He designed it from head to toe. He knows the DNA strands. We would say like the back of his hand. He knows the way the chromosomes have come together. He has counted the hairs on your head. He knows your stature. He knows your number of days. He knows all these things, and so his... His diagnosis of the problem is, I, is as accurate as could be. 
And yet so many of us are so afraid to listen to this diagnosis that we have sinned and we've fallen short. We need some who does not have our problem. And we're asking ourselves, what is the remedy? How many times a day must I take something? How often must I do it? How much physical therapy will be involved? How many times must I go to the hospital? Will I need outpatient services? Will it involve things like, we want to know, what do we need to do to get rid of this ailment? And Jesus Christ said this, it is the most costly of all diagnosis. This, this diagnosis requires a remedy. I've heard of individuals. In fact, I have family members and they, they've had individuals they told me about that to get the necessary pills. I don't even think it was more than one. It was a couple would have cost them a couple of million dollars and they were fundraising to meet the $2 million marker. I can think of my own life going to, to the CVS and, and wondering how much it would cost without insurance and realizing I couldn't afford the prescription without insurance and realizing the tremendous cost there is in just getting medicine and then recognizing for this the most tremendous of problems, what it will cost in order to get healing for my sin. It costs someone everything when it costs Christ his life. It's tremendous that if only I would let down my pride, if only I was willing to admit a problem, because the Bible tells me if I knew how bad the problem was, we said that we know that the wages of sin is death. It will lead me one day to that end point. But to know that God offers, he only offers the diagnosis free. He offers, he offers the medicine. He offers the remedy free. He offers it. And, and, and it's not something that has to be waited in line. I think of a, the next couple of months, how much would be paid for these vaccines for the COVID virus? And, and how many of us would just breathe a sigh of relief to know that we had something that then would equip us to fight this or that we could then once again leave and go beyond the bounds of our towns and our homes with some safety. The cost is immeasurable. The U.S. is investing billions upon billions of dollars to provide this assurance to its citizens. And yet God has invested his son, the death of his son, to give you the ultimate assurance that when you depart this life, you will be absolutely sure that you will not depart this life with sin within you, but instead with Christ within you. How tremendous, how tremendous to know that. You know, no matter how many times I've had a surgery, no matter how many doctors I've been to, not one of them has ever used the term 100%. I had a doctor recently tell me 96% success rate. He says, because I have to tell you that because there are still a lot of people who fall into the 4% category. Let me tell you tonight that the man who said these words, they that are whole don't need a doctor, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He offers a remedy that is guaranteed to heal. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter how long you've had the ailment or how great it is. Sometimes cancer is caught too far. It's, it's, it's gone. It's run too rampant in the body. When people say, it's, I, if I had only got it earlier, if I had gotten checked earlier, then maybe I could have done something. Doesn't matter. Christ offers something that is guaranteed. He never speaks in any other terms but 100% because he gave himself. He gave his sinless life for sinners. And so from the words of the great physician to the words of individuals who, if they could just get rid of the pride that comes up within every heart, as we look at a world that runs rampant with us doing our own things, and us seeking our own remedies, we must recognize that here is one who knows us. He knows us so well, and he knows everything that ails us, and he knows everything that has gone wrong with us. And because of that, he didn't depend on any other medicine. He didn't depend on any other approach than to give himself as a sacrifice in order to save your soul. You could believe that. You know, it's not like a placebo. Sometimes people tell me, if you believe enough in the pill you take, sometimes psychologically it just helps. You know, the amount of your belief doesn't save you. Christ saves you. Doesn't matter. This is not a placebo effect. It's not done just to give you a good feeling inside. This is something that really works. 
This is something that is so true and so needed because there is no other way for you to be made right with God. There is no other way for you to rid your soul of the sin that it has other than Jesus Christ, him crucified. Thank God he's alive. And thank God he still longs to seek and to save those that are sick, those that are sinners. If only you would trust him tonight. Continue to listen as Matt tells us about being whole and how Christ guarantees that. Thank you, Dave. Uh, we're going to read just a uh, verse here in the book of, uh, I was going to read Luke 5 and 31 and 32. Dave read that today, but uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I'm going to read a statement. And the statement says this, the God of peace, 1 Thessalonians 5, look at verse 23 through 24. The God of peace sanctify you wholly. Interesting, as he continues to write, he says, and I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The key is in verse 24 that says uh, this blameless is because faithful is he that calls you who also will do it. Now we're going to take up that word whole. It's actually found 242 times in scripture. When we think of what it means to be whole, we can start right at the beginning of our Bible and we just see that in Genesis chapter 2, you would see this, that the mist watering the whole face of the ground it means not a spot left without mist. You jump to Genesis chapter 7, you'd see that waters prevailing exceedingly upon the earth and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven. The same word is used there, were covered. In Genesis chapter 8, there's a dove that's flying, trying to find footing. And it says the dove finding no place for her foot means that the water's on the face of the whole earth. I'm telling you this because uh, this is key when we look at a word in scripture, where it is found and the death and the capacity of the earth, uh, of that word. Genesis 11 says the whole earth was of one language and one speech. That word whole means all or total or containing the total amount or a number or the entire thing like the whole earth or the whole world or the whole solar system or the whole army or the whole nation. Perhaps a problem today, if you hear it as well as I do, is uh, we make inaccurate assumptive statements like this. That whole party is like this, or that whole church is like this, or that whole race is like this. And they're inaccurate statements. When it comes to the Bible, when God says, for all have sinned, it's an accurate statement. It means the whole of humanity has sinned, complete humanity, entire humanity. That's what this word whole means. Whole. Dave Spett said those words that they that are whole in Luke chapter five, they that are whole need not a physician. Restored to health and soundness is the word whole. To be sound, to be well. I like Dave's statement, life is short, death is sure. Sin the cause and Christ the cure. You say, well, the cure in Christ, you see these cures many times as Jesus walked in this earth. But two that really ring a bell with me really quick are Mark chapter five it says, thy faith has made you whole never to be sick again. Mark chapter three, his hand was restored whole, never to be sick again. So the word whole has the concept of entirety, the whole assemblage of parts to repair and to restore. My son is, uh, my oldest son is trying to put together a go-kart with a little buddy uh, here in Arizona. And uh, the problem with this, uh, with go-karts is this, they don't come with all parts. It's one part at a time. And it's very frustrating. You're constantly trying to make this thing that's supposed to drive down the street whole, but you don't have all the parts. And it reminds me of humanity. The soul without Christ is like a vehicle without the parts. It's broken. It can't do what it's intended to do. God wants men to worship. And we can't worship without knowing Christ. We can't worship without knowing the Godhead. We can't worship without our sins forgiven. We need to be reconciled with the maker. And in this particular example, as it were, we need to be reconciled. There needs to be an order done that all the parts of that car come together and it can actually function. And the part that's missing in your life, if you don't know Christ, is this. You've never come to understand that Jesus Christ died for you on the cross and he rose again. And he's seated at the very right hand of the majesty on, on high. And by believing in him, by trusting in him, by having faith in him, you can know for sure your sins are forgiven. Think of the story in Luke chapter 17. He says unto them, he says, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. Well, in this story, there's 10 lepers who are sick, 10 lepers who have a tremendous problem. They're cleansed, but only one returns to thank Christ. That one, he says, was made whole. Not only 
physically cleansed of leprosy, but also salvation of his soul. The Greek Testament of critical exegetical uh, commentary says this, in a higher sense than the mere cleansing of his leprosy, theirs was merely the beholding of the brazen serpent with outward eyes, these other lepers. But his, the leper that comes back to see Christ with the eye of inward faith, faith saves him not only healing his body, but of his soul. And God today wants to make the sinner who is sick and broken whole again. There are many families, if you reflect even self-reflection on perhaps your own family or friends that you have, and you look around and you say, yeah, you're right. Friends, uh, families today are not whole. They're broken. Sin has broken relationships in a variety of capacities. And God wants to reconcile the sick, those that are in their sins, to himself and make them whole. Google just announced a new uh, underwater internet cable. Fascinating to me because I don't know much about engineering, but I do know this. It connects the U.S. to the U.K. and to Spain. Hundreds of millions of dollars spent, thousands of miles, this cable, this fiber optic cable is gonna go under the sea, under the ocean. And the cable is called the Grace, G-R-A-C-E, Hopper. The Grace Hopper. They say it's the largest communicatory connection ever. And I sat back as I read this article, which was absolutely fascinating. I thought the largest communicatory connection ever, not really. God's communicatory connection, his, if I could use the word respectfully, grace hopper, the one who brought grace to mankind came from heaven and he came to earth, born in a manger. He went to a cross death. He's been bringing men and women together, united in the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, men and women filled with diversity from all parts of the world, all parts of different languages, different tongues, different ethnicities, different cultural backgrounds. And he brings them all together at one place, and it's found at a cross. I love what Priscilla Owens and William Kirkpatrick in 1882 wrote, uh, give the winds, listen to these words of this beautiful hymn, give the winds a mighty voice, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation, full and free, highest hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, not the pastor saves, or not the church saves, or not the particular denomination saves. As Dave mentioned, Christ saves, and that's found in the word of God. When someone is saved, you see that truth in 1 Thessalonians 5, that the very God of peace sanctifies you holy, whole spirit, soul, and body are preserved. I love what Psalm 103 says, praise the Lord, O my soul, with all that is within me. You say, well, why is he praising his name? Well, here's what he keeps writing. Do not forget all his kind deeds. He is the one who forgives all your sins, who heals all your diseases, or the word there is deadly in Greek, who delivers or redeems, again in Greek, your life from the pit, who crowns you with his loyal love and compassion, who satisfies your life with good things so your youth is renewed like an eagle's. Out of their bellies, God's word says, will flow rivers of living water when one comes to trust in Christ. God today wants to supernaturally, radically, profoundly, something we don't understand, and eternally, change your life. Once dead, now alive. Once lost, now found. Once blind, now can see. Once in the family of sin, now in the family of God. Once enslaved by sin, now freed by sin's bondage. Once in despair, now you have eternal life. And once sick, as Dave spoke about being sick, now whole. Sick from what? Death and sin. Condemned already. I'm just speaking today, friend, what the word of God teaches unjust, unholy, unrighteous per God's standards of perfection, the plague of being born into sin and its progressive negative destructive lifestyle. That's what we're sick from. The scars of sin, the burdens of sin, the regrets of sin without strength to help ourselves, desperately needing to be reconciled. A huge gap between God and man without all the parts, as it were, to make us whole and complete in Christ. We could be made complete. How? Simply because of Christ's death on the cross. Bloodshed that satisfied a Godhead. Hebrews 9 and verse 22 says these words. Indeed, according to the law, almost everything was purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. We crave to be whole because human beings were made for it. John 10 and 10 says the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come, Christ says, that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. The enemy has robbed man of self-worth. The enemy has robbed man of respect. The enemy has robbed man of relationships or true relationships. The enemy has robbed man of peace. The enemy has robbed man of hope. The enemy has robbed man of true love. Christ came though 
to give whole life. Christ came to give life more abundantly. Changing the psychological of, of the mind, if you can even use those words, the change of mindset to seek things that are above. Physically, you change your life. In your testimony, in the, as being the salt of the earth, noticing a change of heart and desire as the world looks to someone who was in their sins at one point and now saved. They've been born again. They've been born anew, born from above. And they're different. They watch them different. They watch them behave differently. They watch their walk spiritually as they have a hunger for the word of God. The Holy Spirit is now within. They have new life. They've been made whole. Whole. You can be made whole today. To have that purpose, to worship God. We think, when we think of whole, when it comes to the body, uh, sorry, the gospel, just think of this here for a second. I get it as crystal clear as I can. The whole of man sinned, not part of man, all of man. The whole of man fell short of the glory of God, not part of man, the whole man. The whole of man disobeyed and broke the law. The whole of man can't get to heaven with their own works. Now let's go to what Christ did. The whole of God had loved sinners. The whole of God had provided a substitutionary sacrifice for sinners. The whole of Christ, not part of Christ, not just his hands, not just the crown that was placed upon his brow, but the whole of Christ from the top to the bottom was sinless and just. The whole of Christ shed blood. He died on a cross for sinners. The whole of Christ rose again. The whole of Christ calls the sinner to come to him. Him that comes to me, boy or girl, I will never cast out. He says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Salvation is provided universally to the world, yet personal in its application. Let's go through John 3.16 just so I can show you what I mean. For God so loved the world, the whole world, that he gave his only begotten son for the whole world, universal still, that whosoever, now we get personal, believes in him or wholly believes in him, will not perish but have everlasting life, the whole life and life more abundantly. Recently, there was an orca whale, a killer whale named Tala Quay. The story was that she carried her dead 300-pound whale child for over 1,000 miles for 17 days. It was such an extreme that it prompted a worldwide concern for the grief-stricken mom, given their already endangered population. They're endangered, and she's traveling, carrying another 300 pounds of weight that is another dead whale, and it's her child. Grief-stricken. I've spoken to many on uh, losing a child, an incredible loss. Parents have told me never to be the same again. Parents' worst nightmare sometimes, waking up 30 years down the road and uh, the vision of the, and, the, and the, 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 the place of the casket of their child is so vivid. It's there. They've never forgotten it. Some have told me, I still wake up. It's still a nightmare to me. I've lost my child. I'll never forget it. You say more love than that? More love than a parent's love for their child? What was it like for eternity past, for God the Father to have a plan to give his only son for a fallen race, knowing to that he would in time watch man in their wickedness in the Old Testament, knowing a savior was coming. They reject him in his life. He watches Peter deny him at a cross. He watches human beings who Christ was coming to seek and to save the lost. He's coming to die for them. And those human beings say, crucify him. And the father is watching people make fun of his son and hurt his son. He watches people spit on his son. He watches people open his back like a plowed field and lash at his back. He watches human beings place a crown of thorns on his son and they mock him. He watches human beings nail his hands and nail his feet into a wood. And they raise him between heaven and earth. And they sing in their drunken mockeries of his son. If you're the Christ, save yourself and come down. And they crucify Christ in violence and hatred. What was it for God to look down upon a race like that? It was love for you. And it was love for me. He loved his son. He gave his son just for you. The hymn writer wrote, what was it, O our God, let thee to give thy son, to yield thy well-beloved for us by sin undone. T'was love unbounded, led thee thus to give thy well-beloved for us. God didn't give part of his son. He gave his whole son to pay for your whole debt of sin. And God promises through John chapter 3 and verse 36, he or she that believes on the son has everlasting life. If you don't have the new birth, if you've never been born again, if you've never been saved, you'll always struggle in your sin, sickness to be whole. Very interesting if you look at the recent study, it's a documentary on, called The Weight of Gold. It's on a documentary on Olympic athletes and really the heartbreaking mental health challenges as the society looks on and, and envies and 
uh, we sort of covet their lifestyle. We say, boy, if I could just be like the Mr. Phelps, or if I could just be, but there's actually some heartbreaking things that are truths here. This documentary states they're, they feel they're never good enough. They're never fast enough. They're never strong enough. And they go through uh, sad times and discouraging times and depression times. Listen to this. To know you're enough. To know you're complete. To know you're whole in the person of Christ who's always making intercession just for you. The one who's keeping your eternal relationship and home in heaven. Secure. Never to be broken through his precious blood and an old rugged cross. To have that peace. To have that hope. To have that invitation by the Christ. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What does Jesus say? The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Are you lost? Burdened about your sin. You know that you're sick in your sin. You'd love to be made whole. There's only one place that the making of whole comes into fruition, and that's found on an old rugged cross. And Christ says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest rest. I close with Dave's statement. He said these words, life is short, death is sure, sin the cause, and Christ the cure. If you're sick in your sins, you can come to know Christ today and be made whole for the very first time in your life. Sins forgiven, past, present, and future, and a home in heaven. Why? Because Christ is the cure, and he will make you whole today.